next item. NSBA conference, you're up again. So we uh, mm -hmm. did have Dr. Shankman, a no. member of McDonald, and member Shellis, attend a conference, and they're going to give us a report on that. Get to come on the other side. <laughs> See how it is on the mm -hmm. other side of the fence. <laughs> yeah. I promise we'll be brief. Um, this year's conference, I, I attended along with uh, Trustee McDonald and Dr. Shankman. Not only did we attend, but we also presented at the conference. So we'll cover both of that during our presentation. Uh, this is an annual conference, the National School Board Association. It's attended by about, what, 8,000 or so? Yeah, it's, uh, depending on the year, it's been anywhere from six to 10,000. I think this year was probably around seven or 8,000 um, board members and district administrators. So it's a, a pretty extensive conference. Um, we had a uh, couple of really interesting guest speakers, and I have to say that I was really pleasantly surprised by D Gina Davis. I liked her as an actress, but as an advocate for children, I am even more impressed by her. I wish that we were able to videotape uh, the speech that she gave because it was quite empowering about women in the media and girls in the media and how the media influences um, what our girls grow up to be. And it was interesting, the statistics that she, sh that she showed. She uh, founded an a, a organization called the Gina Davis Institute in ge of Gender in the Media. And they do a lot of research in the past and, and as the future goes on about women's place in movies and entertainment. Um, and she talked about some statistics about women in roles of importance and leadership on television. And surprisingly enough, that number hasn't changed very much over the last 40 or so, 50 years. Um, and it's right about 17%, no matter what they looked at, no matter how they segregated it. And that includes um, animated movies, which you know, is kind of interesting when you're talking about uh, shaping children's lives and, and how media influences um, our girls and what they, what they grow up to be. One of the things that she did talk about was the number of, uh, the increase in the number of girls that are going into forensic sciences um, and the impact that shows like NCIS and CSI have had on women and girls in science occupations. And so I thought it was kind of interesting. One little antidote that she had talked about was, um, I think it was the Boston Symphony, um, found that they had more male um, musicians than they did female musicians and they thought that there might be a problem with it so they held closed uh, auditions c behind the curtain auditions so that only you know the the people who were were judging them would only hear and not see and after they did these auditions it came back that the same exact percentage of males to females it wasn't 50 50 I can't remember the exact statistics and they were shocked and said you know that how can this be you know that there was no you know is it really is it really that men are um, are more skilled at musicians than women are. And one of the people that was there said, um, maybe we should have them take their shoes off before they come into the audition. Because the sound of the heels walking across the floor. So when they did this, and they had the people come in with no shoes on, all of a sudden it became 50-50 male and female. And so it was really enlightening and talked about just how your preconceived notions that biases that you have that you don't even recognize that you have um, and how that's impacting our children. So I told you I would be brief and then I just rambled on forever. So I apologize. <laughs> um, I'm going to have Trustee McDonald speak about the next keynote speaker. Good evening. I was so excited to hear that Neil deGrasse Tyson would be a keynote speaker. I have followed him for many years on NOVA, The Daily Show, and even Jeopardy. He is my favorite astrophysicist, and I have so many. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Hawking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a few out there. Um, he pro proposed that a large part of the reason why U.S. is falling behind in math and science behind the rest of the world is cultural. Americans are afraid of numbers, he said, and to bring home this fact, he showed photos taken in elevators in various hotels and office buildings around the country and they were all missing the number 13. And then he said that uh, other countries or other advanced nations embrace math and science. And he said to illustrate this statement, he showed dozens of photo uh, photographs of currency from other countries and uh, most of them or all of them had portraits of great, uh, um, 
great scientists and great inventors on them. One country even had a bell curve and an actual equation, a math equation, printed right on the currency. And he uh, then asked, were there any inventors or scientists on American currency? Can anyone think of any? Ben Franklin. Yes, there is one. You're right. Ben Franklin, but he's not, uh, his claim to fame isn't that of being a, a scientist or an inventor as much as it is as being a founding father. That's why he's on the currency. But he went on to discuss the importance of teaching our students not only to be, not, or not to be intimidated by math and science, but to embrace it and to learn to love math and science. He's humorous, he's down to earth, and he was very thought provoking, and I was not disappointed at all. Um, we all went to several breakout sessions, and so we want to kind of give you an overview of the sessions that we attended. We try to coordinate with each other so that we don't attend the same sessions so that we can bring home more information. I highlighted four of the sessions that I attended, and, and just you know, so you know, there are really some wonderful sessions, both for school board members and also for um, district administrators at the conference. So the first session I attended was the BYOD session, and that stands for Bring Your Own Device in the Classroom and Beyond. So for quite a while, we've been telling students, don't bring your cell phone, put it away, don't turn it on, and we're kind of getting over that, slowly but surely. Um, the presentation had to do with the idea that we should, instead of not allowing them, we should embrace them because people are carrying computers with them and maybe it would be a good idea to utilize that instead of buying a bunch of stuff ourselves. Um, there's lots of hurdles to get over, but we certainly um, need to look into that idea more thoroughly. Another session I attended was Early Warning Tracking System, a research-based intervention for reducing the dropout rate. And I attended this because, as some of you probably already know, this is a passion of mine, is reducing the dropout rate and, more importantly, getting more students to graduate on time. Um, and I was hopeful that I would get some good, useful information. But sometimes you just get confirmation of what you're doing. And this was more or less one of those <coughs> sessions. So we're pretty cutting edge with our graduation intervention specialists and with our checking the data and kids building relationships with people. That was really what I came away from this presentation with, was the idea that at-risk students need to build a relationship with one adult in every building. Um, and we need to remember that because that's what's going to make all the difference in the world with our kids, relationships with the adults that care about them in the building. Another session I went to was titled, One Urban, One Suburban, One Rural District and a Community College Unite to Build a Successful Future for Students. And I was thinking about our Collegiate Academy five-year plan when I attended that. This wasn't quite that. It was um, about these districts and the community college working together and getting scholarships um, post-secondary and, and working together in that regard. So getting financing for students to go to community college after they left high school. It was very interesting. Um, and they have a nice collaboration established so that they follow through. One thing I did gain from this was the importance of tracking things. So all of our seniors need to commit to um, turning in a college application if that's what they want to do. And it, it means that we need to hound them. Um, hound them, hound them on a regular basis and, and starting in the junior year and make sure that get, they get that application in. Parents in this group, in some of these schools, weren't people who had experience of going to college, so they didn't know the ropes. And we need to make sure that all of our students, regardless of where they come from, have that opportunity to attend college and we in, uh, empower them by us knowing the ropes and helping them in that regard. And the last session that I'm going to talk about is auditing your special education department. And I attended that one because I had some curious curiosity about some ways that we can look to evaluate our department and, and see if we can um, always improve what we've, what we've accomplished. Um, and they talked about a special education review um, where the special education department reviews themselves, so a personal review. Um, and some of the questions that were part of that were um, under different sections. Powerful teaching and learning. Are our students placed in the least restrictive en environment and in accordance with IDEA? And some questions related to that. So asking ourselves that question. Are students learning and what evidence do we have to show that? Um, safe and secure school buildings. Are our classrooms equipped to meet the needs of our students? Human resources, um, are the staff being used efficiently and effectively? 
financial responsibility? Are we maintaining proper records of expenditures to secure reimbursements from the state and other agencies? And active community involvement. Do parents and community understand the district's protocol in regard to special education eligibility and placement? And we do have our special ed PTA, so we're um, ahead of the game from a lot of districts. But I think that these are all important questions, and um, we'll be sharing this with Mr. Shelton in regard to our special educators. Thank you.